bom dia a todos e a todas. É, a gente vai dar sequência ao ciclo de seminários Mulheres na Física, desse mês de março. Na verdade, é o último seminário desse semestre aqui na UFMG. A gente retoma em meados de maio. A programação já está no site, para quem quiser dar uma olhada. Então, a, a, como nos outros uh, dias de março, a Simone vai fazer uma pequena introdução e depois a gente vai para o seminário da Karen e aí a gente muda para o inglês. Então, Simone, por favor. Então, bom dia a todos e a todas. É, bom, aqui eu vou apresentar de novo uns poucos dados, né? E agora, fazendo interseção, né? até o momento, até a semana passada, apresentei alguns dados muito relacionados com a questão de gênero, né? Gênero falando mais em sexo biológico, né? Masculino e feminino. Apresentei um pouquinho sobre identidade e orientação sexual também, alguns números, né? E aqui eu vou apresentar mais dados que... É, faz a interseção de todas essas questões que, que, que podem né, servir e funcionam às vezes como filtros sociais né, para o alcance das pessoas no meio acadêmico e em outras comunidades também. Mas na física é uma coisa muito gritante, muito, é, muito clara, né, que a gente realmente tem minoria é, aqui. Né? Então, para falar da questão feminina, né? É importante também notar que quando até a semana passada que eu falei foram as condições das mulheres que são praticamente brancas e vindas de classes socioeconômicas é, praticamente as mesmas, tá? Então hoje eu vou apresentar alguns dados ainda que é um diagnóstico que continua sendo diagnóstico da Sociedade Brasileira de Física, né? Falando das questões raciais e é, e, socio, e socioeconômicas. Então, aqui só para falar, para explicar né, a questão de raça, é, aqui a gente tá, é, utiliza a palavra raça, né, o ser humano é uma raça só, ponto, né, mas é como uma, uma questão política, né, é um instrumento analítico para usar em sociologia, porque se estende-se que, é, entende que as percepções e concepções de raça podem afetar e organizar a vida social das pessoas, sendo responsável principalmente pela criação e manutenção de um sistema de desigualdade social. Então, raça aqui é utilizado, essa palavra é utilizada com esse conceito. E não quer passar? <risos> ah, ok. Então, é, da, da pesquisa que a gente fez da Sociedade Brasileira de Física, né, lembrando que aqui a gente teve 1.695 respondentes, né, quando a gente perguntou sobre a raça ou etnia, né, o grupo étnico é, pertencente de cada pessoa, a gente viu que, somando tudo, né, 26% só da Sociedade Brasileira de Física se autodeclara preta ou parda. Né? E, segundo o IBGE, a população brasileira é, parda e negra né, corresponde a 54% da população. Claro que isso também é dividido entre as regiões de forma desigual. Né? Se a gente olha é, por, por grupos de etnia, né, a evolução na carreira, a gente vê de novo que esses, os grupos né, de negros pardos e outras minorias, né, eles também sofrem uma tesourada, né, sofrem um efeito tesoura. O outro aspecto é, muito forte da nossa sociedade, muito importante, que define muito onde cada um vai estar no futuro, né, é a origem é, de classe social. Né? Então, isso aqui é um, 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 são dados né, da World Economic Forum, é, onde eles fazem uma análise imensa né, de aspectos socioeconômicos do mundo. Né? E um dos dados que tem nesse, nesse é um, um livro, na verdade, né, que tem nesse livro, é, é o número de gerações que uma pessoa que nasceu em classe baixa, né? leva para se aproximar da renda média, da renda média do país, né? E aí a gente vê aqui, né, a colocação, a, a distribuição para os vários países, né? A Dinamarca que é o mais é, bem bem colocado nessa situação, né? Eles levam duas gerações para uma pessoa de classe baixa, de baixa renda, né? Se aproximar da renda média. E no Brasil a gente leva nove gerações. Então a questão socioeconômica, ela ela afeta em todos os aspectos da sociedade, né? 
e no Brasil é uma coisa bem grave também, muito grave, né? E só lembrando aqui, isso aqui é um outro dado, é, onde fala que a renda média do trabalhador brasileiro em 2020, aqui é efeito da pandemia também, né, e outros efeitos, caiu de 20,1%, né, e hoje ela passou, ela passou de 1.118 para 893 reais mensais. Bom, isso está diretamente associado com esse com essa, esse outro diagnóstico aqui que nós fizemos, né? Então, onde que nasceram, onde, onde nasceram e onde estão os pesquisadores, os estudantes, né? E docentes em física no Brasil, né? Então, a gente pode ver aqui, ó, esse gráfico maior, né? Aqui é a região de nascimento e aqui é a região de residência, né? A gente, é, os físicos estão praticamente no sudeste, né? Aí depois vem nordeste e, e sul mas é, nascem no, no, no Sudeste e continuam no Sudeste. Né? Ainda existe uma pequena mobilidade mesmo das, das outras regiões, mesmo que para o Sudeste a mobilidade é muito pequena. Né? Isso está extremamente relacionado com a distribuição extremamente desigual do país, né? onde o dinheiro se concentra nessa região. É, além das, da, dessas questões é, né, contadas aqui antes, né, a gente também diagnosticou é, questões como deficiência. Né? Então, só do, dos entrevistados, só 6,2% dos entre, entrevistados declararam ter alguma, algum tipo de deficiência. Né? A maior parte são, são pessoas que têm visão baixa ou anormal. Né? É, alguns... Né, seguido aí por limitações físicas e motoras e outras de origem é, emocional, né? É, do, das de origem emocional, o caso mais é, frequente, né, que a gente observou foi o transtorno bipolar. Então, como uma conclusão geral de todos esses dados que eu apresentei durante esses dias, né, a nossa sociedade ela não é diversa sob nenhum aspecto, né? É composta por 68% de homens brancos. É, 61% de pessoas brancas, né, 88% heterossexuais e 59% residem no, no Sudeste. Bom, e por último, eu queria só colocar aqui, né, a gente está falando dessa questão feminina, e ela é falada, está em consonância com o que acontece no mundo, é uma questão, as questões de minoria, né, elas, elas voltaram a ser tratadas é, no mundo inteiro, né, e aqui no Brasil a gente vai com atraso, vai com modéstia, vai com medo, né? vai com, com um monte de restrição, mas também está acontecendo. Então aqui eu só queria mostrar, essa é uma é, imagem né, da Márcia Barbosa, que é uma das professoras que, que vem é, lutando, falando, levantando dados e tentando promover né, ou esclarecer que existe uma questão, existe um problema relacionado às mulheres no meio acadêmico e em especial na física. né? E a Márcia, é, ela, né, além do, do reconhecimento aqui interno, ela tem reconhecimento é, em várias instâncias no mundo inteiro. Né? Então, ela, ela ganhou o Prêmio L'Oréal para mulheres, né? e a ONU é, escolheu a, ela, né, declarou ela como uma das mulheres que moldam o mundo. E é por esse trabalho, em especial por esse trabalho de tentar esclarecer, mudar né, e indicar a condição das mulheres no meio acadêmico. Né? E também em 2017, ela foi eleita uma das, das dez mulheres mais poderosas do Brasil, pela revista Forbes. Né? E, e só mais uma, é, mais uma transparência aqui, mais um, um, um dado. Né? É, isso aqui é uma... É um, um pedaço do, do discurso do Carl Weiden, que foi ganhador do Nobel em 2001. Né? Ele se refere aos Estados Unidos, mas é, para nós a, a questão é maior do que isso. Né? Ele fala assim, enquanto o país enfrenta o racismo sistêmico e outras formas de discrimina discriminação, nós do ensino superior, incluindo departamentos de física, precisamos refletir sobre como podemos estar inadvertidamente sustentando essas barreiras. 
Meu grupo de pesquisa tem estudado os fatores que determinam o sucesso dos alunos em cursos introdutórios de física na faculdade e os dados mostram como o ensino de física e o currículo atual estão apoiando a discriminação sistêmica. Um fator de capacitação primário é o, é o conceito de que os alunos podem ser classificados em termos de seu talento, supostamente uma quantidade fundamental que reflete sua capacidade de fazer física. Aí ele conclui, não é talento, é privilégio. Bom, então, da minha parte é isso, eu passo para a Carol de novo. Obrigada, Simone. So we switch to English now. I will introduce Karen. So Karen, it's a great pleasure to have you here. So uh, uh, Karen did her studies at Instituto Balseiro in Argentina. Uh, after getting her PhD, she went to Germany for a postdoc at Max Planck Institute. Back to Argentina, she became a researcher of the Centro Atomico Bariloche in uh, 1997. And one year later, she became a professor at Instituto Balzeiro. Uh, she has been invited uh, to go to many places all over the world to, to, as an invited uh, researcher. She has been a member of many committees. I will just cite a few because we need to let Karen talk also. So she's an associate member of ICTP, the International Center for Theoretical Physics, both the one in Trieste, Italy, and the one in Sao Paulo, which is, which is the South America branch. Uh, very recently, she was elected international, international counselor of the American Physical Society. Uh, she got many prizes and honors. For example, she's a corresponding member of the Argentinian Academy for Exact and Natural Sciences. She's a member of the Latin American Academy of Sciences. Uh, she got the uh, 2019 L'Oreal and UNESCO Prize for Women in Science. This is, was an international prize. She got the one for Latin America region. Uh, she's an honorary fellow of the Marie Curie Fellowship, supported by the International Atomic Energy Agency. So I think uh, uh, we need to let Karen talk. So this is just a brief introduction. She has a vast CV as you can realize. And uh, today she will uh, talk to us about emergent phenomena and complexity in condensed matter. So please care, Karen, it's with you now. Thanks a lot for accepting the invitation. Do, did you try to? to bon <laughs> yes, I, I, I try now. So bon, bon dia, uh, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I really wish I could be uh, giving this talk in Portuguese. I, I always like to speak different languages, but well, I hope I can do it next time. Um, Carol, uh, thank you so much, and also to the, the, the Department of Physics of the Universidad Federal de Minas Gerais for this uh, invitation. I, I feel very, very honored uh, to, to be here with you today. I, I also really would have expected to be there in, in uh, presence. But uh, because since I went, I visited um, Belo Horizonte um, two years ago, and then Ouro Preto, uh, I really enjoyed the place, the people, and also meeting all of you, and, and you, Carol, and, and your group, and uh, Teresa, uh, Paiva, and other colleagues in, in Brazil. So it's very nice to be here with you and, uh, and collaborating, and I really hope we can enhance our collaboration uh, between Argentina and, and Brazil. Uh, so. Uh, this is, uh, I, I was very happy to, thank you very much, uh, Simone, for your, word, for your words. I'm very happy to see that uh, yes, you and, uh, and other people there are so active in, in trying to raise awareness on the situation of uh, not only of women in, in science and women in physics, uh, but also, and this, and this is especially important for our region, the situation of other uh, disadvantaged groups uh, in, in their access in particular to science. I think this is very important uh, that we also include this when we talk about uh, uh, women in, in science and that we also talk about uh, the lost opportunities that other young people have in the access to, to science and to, in general, I mean, to, to uh, their uh, improvement of their well-being and their, uh, their, uh, uh, and their access to other uh, benefits. So I think this is, this is very important that in our region, we also emphasize 
we also emphasize this. So thank you very much, Simone. When I finish, I I want I also want to say some words on my activities uh, in the situation of, uh, in particular, of women in, in science and women in physics. Uh, Carol asked me to do so, then I, I'll briefly mention that uh, when I finish my presentation. Uh, let me share then uh, my talk. Um, I want to uh, I want to um, talk today and uh, tell you about our work uh, in what we call emergent phenomena and, co and complexity in condensed matter. Um, we, we have been working in this for some time. Uh, it's a general framework that I think it describes very well the complex behavior of, of condensed matter and in particular the systems that have uh, many body interactions and uh, it, it, this is uh, the most uh, it includes most of the most important materials or the materials that have potential applications uh, so this is why this topic is uh, is so relevant and so difficult to tackle because it's not uh, it's it's um, you do you do not um, it's not enough to resort to usual techniques uh, we use to study other materials, more simple materials, materials that do not have a, a, a strong interactions between electrons, and we have to resort to strong numerical simulation. Um, we uh, have developed uh, some complex codes, uh, some programs that are based on quantum information to extract the most important uh, information of these systems and to be able to to choose and to filter the, the relevant states in the system. So of the millions and millions, exponentially large amount of states in, in these systems, I mean, we're looking at the quantum behavior, of course, uh, of the exponentially large amount of states, we want to uh, stay uh, with very, very few, with a very few percentage of states to, that uh, we know that these states are enough to understand the behavior of some of these systems. So this is where I want to take you. I want to tell you about the concept of um, emergent phenomena in general, and then I want to go to uh, show you some, uh, some of our um, results. Uh, so here we start with a view of Bariloche in winter. Uh, so it, it would be very nice to, to host you whenever you can, on weekend travel, <laughs> and I hope so in the near future. Uh, this is where we are, in the, so not so far from Brazil, in the south of Argentina. Uh, I'm in Mendoza now, so slightly further north, uh, because uh, I came with a, uh, an international project called uh, Pierre Auger Project Observatory for the Measurement of Cosmic Rays, High Energy Cosmic Rays. Uh, so here is where I am uh, doing home office. And this is an aerial view of the campus in the uh, Centro Atomico Bariloche. Here we have the lakes, and this is in the middle, you see the, our houses and the labs. It's, it's uh, over a year I haven't been working there because of the pandemic, and I also hope we can go back to our labs uh, pretty soon. So let's go to the, um, to the concept uh, to, to talk about, about physics. What is the concept of, of immersion uh, as defined by the US National Academies? Uh, Emergent phenomena, let me just read it, uh, it's in condensed matter and material physics, are those that cannot be understood with models that treat the motions of the individual particles within the material independently. Instead, the essence of emergent phenomena lies in complex interactions between many particles that result in the diverse behavior and often unpredictable collective motion of many particles. So many words, but I mean, you get the idea that uh, it's, uh, we have many particles, we have interaction, and then it is not enough to know the individual motion of each one of the particles to then extrapolate and put everything together. But there are new phenomena that arise by the fact that all of these particles are, um, are together. So we cannot predict the behavior of the whole system by understanding the behavior of individual particles. Uh, Phil Anderson, uh, a couple of years ago, in, in his book, More is Different, which is very interesting, uh, also this, in this uh, article in Science, he talks about the reductionist hypothesis that does not by any means imply a constructionist one. one. So the ability to reduce everything to simple fundamental laws does not imply the ability to start from those fundamental laws and reconstruct the universe. So this is uh, ideally one could do it if one has infinite computational power, but this is not, not even uh, philosophically or epistemolog epistemologically possible as according to Phil Anderson, and I agree with his, with his view. 
Bob Laughlin, another, another Nobel laureate, uh, says that everything that matters in science nowadays is organizational. So we have to understand the organizational interaction. The reductionist hypothesis, the fundamental approach, has stopped from being useful. So, well, I mean, people, some people do not agree with this, but uh, we do see it in condensed matter. That's why condensed matter theory or condensed matter physics is so interesting because, uh, uh, because we really are facing and we do find experimentally and theoretically emergent phenomena in these systems. Let me, let me um, make a comparison with classical systems. Here there's a list of things, for example, the emergent behavior in different aspects. For example, if we have uh, the phenomenon of the, if we look at ant colonies, the individual pieces are ants, but when they are all together, they, for, they act as a, an individual, as a collective a group of, uh, as a, a huge uh, living organism, which is uh, not uh, understood by the understanding of each uh, a particular ant. And the, the interactions are the pheromone trails between, for example, that's the interaction of how they, they smell or they sense each other. What happens with consciousness? This is also something interesting to think about because the individual pieces and neurons uh, and, uh, and the interactions and neural, neural connections and firing. If we understand the behavior of each particular neuron, uh, and then we start putting uh, neurons uh, in, in a system, one next to the other, and we make them uh, interact, uh, do we get consciousness? Or is there a critical number of neurons above which we will get consciousness as an emergent phenomena? Does it depend on the number of neurons? Or for example, does it depend on um, on the topology of the interactions, on the amount of interactions, or on both, probably on both, but we don't even know what consciousness is, so it's very difficult to pose the question correctly. But this is a, a very typical example of an emergent phenomenon. Life is also an emergent phenomenon. Of a, of we have a, a bunch of, of, uh, of molecules and, and cells, uh, and then suddenly we get life and we have self-replicating organisms. Crystals and for example, well, here is a, and uh, many other examples, uh, but I think you can get the idea already. For example, in crystals, we have uh, in, in quantum condensed matter, there's a very nice paper, uh, Prasinski et al. It's, uh, some years ago, where the question is they posed, they asked, was, is there a critical number of atoms of water molecules above which crystal order emerges? So. Uh, they, they, they did the experiment and they also did numerical uh, calculations where they put water um, uh, molecules together and they started by, by very few of them. Uh, then, for example, when they have 123 of them to the left, they have a, uh, an amorphous system. But then when uh, they got to 293, they saw that the system started acquiring a long range order, a crystalline order. And then if you look here at the N equals 600 water molecules, they found that in the inner part of the crystal, they find some hexagonal order. Um, so this is uh, the, uh, the emergent crystalline order that appears in some of the, in this condensed matter system, in particular, uh, uh, an ice, uh, a piece of ice. So what if now uh, we not only uh, combine complexity, but we also add the quantum weirdness, so the quantum physics. So now we have complexity and quantum physics. Uh, so this is, gets even more untractable in simple words. Uh, so uh, here we have the interesting topic of quantum condensed matter, where we have the emergent phenomena together with quantum laws. Um, one of the interesting a phenomenon I can mention as an example is the separation of charge and spin uh, as an emergent phenomenon in low dimensional systems. Let's think we have uh, these systems exist, systems where we have a crystal in order in one, mainly in one, di in one direction, they're very anis anisotropic. Uh, we have these systems and then in this system we have, for example, electrons. We can model this system with a very simple model, like in this cartoon here, where we have a one dimension, look at the first row, we have a one, uh, uh, we have a chain, and in this chain, we have these arrows that are spins up and spins down. Uh, these are electrons, and we know that an electron has a negative charge and has a, a spin, a one half. Um, 
the interesting thing is that already in one dimension we can see that the spin and the charge of the electron can can be separate excitations in the system. So we can separate the electron and break it up into two, and the spin uh, has a, a, its own life and the charge has its own life, like you can see in this cartoon, for example. If I um, I do an ARPES or photoemission experiment and I extract an electron, I take it away. I create a charge and spin excitation here in this red dot. Now, uh, let's go to the second row where we can see that, uh, for example, the spins can interact with each other. And when you see this uh, a wobbly red line means that we have a, a spin excitation because we have two parallel spins. And this is like a spin on, in the system. These two parallel spins, spins can move, for example, to the, to the left with a spin velocity. On the other hand, the red dot, which is a charge excitation, can travel, let's say, to the right, also independently from the spin, and we have what is called a hole on. A hole because it's a, it's a lack of an electron with, this, with a charge velocity. So here we have a, a spin on hole on separation due to interactions on, in this system. And this is also weird because we know that um, the, the fundamental entity is an electron with its with its charge and spin, and we could never have imagined that the spin and charge can separate in a one-dimensional system. Uh, we also, um, well, I can get, uh, give you other examples later on. So this charge and spin separation several years ago in a work uh, published with colleagues here in Bariloche, we, we, we did a very simple calculation. We had a, a, a ring formed of, of 16 sites, and in this, this ring is a one-dimensional system. We had electrons hopping from one side to the other, and this is mimicking an interacting uh, metal. So <clears throat> when, there were no, in, when there's no interaction in the system, so the, the electrons just pass uh, by each other without interacting, well, this is not uh, a real situation, but we have a Coulomb interaction. When we do not have a Coulomb interaction, as you see in the left uh, here, increasing time towards the bottom, what we're measuring is the charge on the top and the spin on the bottom uh, density. So the top curve means uh, at time t equals zero, I add an electron to the system and I measure its distribution. Uh, you see the x-axis here is the site in the, in the system. So I created in site number four, um, and uh, with a Gaussian distribution. So spin and charge have the same distribution. As we increase time, now the, this electron will move and, and spin and charge are going to be exactly the same, although the overall distribution will change a little bit because the, the, the dispersion relation is not linear, it's a cosine. So you see here, it's the, the electron is moving to the right and, and charged in the top and spin are uh, moving exactly the same. So we do not have charge and spin separation. If we, if we put an interaction in the system, for example, uh, uh, what we call a local interaction U, if this is like, uh, called a Hubbard model, we create the electron, a full electron we put in the system at time t equals zero, and then we measure the charge and spin velocities. And as you see, the charge at the top moves uh, rap more rapidly than the spin at the bottom. The charge is already moving more rapidly to the right. It goes out uh, because we have periodic boundary conditions. It goes out uh, to the right and comes in to the left, while the spin has barely moved. So here we have a clear situation of charge and spin separation in, in this interacting system. This was a very simple calculation. We had to, well, simple, but we had to use an exact diagonalization for huge matrices because here we have an interacting system. And uh, the interesting thing is that now recently there's an archive paper. Uh, by, by Google, uh, by the group of artificial intelligence in Google and collaborators, where they, uh, luckily they, say, they cite our paper, <laughs> and they, uh, they also do the same experiment, but in Sycamore, in their quantum computer. Uh, what they do is, um, they, uh, they, they do this experiment in this quantum computer that, is, that consists of, uh, like I say here on the bottom, uh, superconducting resonators. So the qubit is a superconducting resonator. They have over 600 of these uh, resonators, and they were very, uh, they were very careful and and very, um, uh, they were very good in controlling the errors and the decoherence. This is the main problem of quantum computers, the decoherence. So they got very, uh, a very good um, system. 
they they look in then at 16 qubits that means um, a system uh, of uh, eight uh, Harvard sites and they also look at charge and spin uh, separation in this system where they model the quantum resonators in a certain way as uh, they have the hoppings, they have the interaction. Now I, I show you the quantum circuit in a while. So this is similar to what people do also in, in cold atoms. In fact, in cold atoms, experiments have also uh, simulated uh, this charge and spin separation. So cold atoms uh, and these quantum computers are quantum simulators of the real world. And as you see here, then in, uh, as, we, uh, as we increase the time, t equals zero, 1.2, et cetera, uh, at 10 t equals zero, they create um, a, a, a charge and a spin, so an electron at a certain site, you see the site index. And then when they increase time, the red, it's a spin index and the blue is, is a charge. And so here you see the charge also dispersing and moving completely independently from the spin as time evolves. So this was very nice to see that using a quantum computer, one can also simulate uh, uh, use it as a quantum quantum computer simulation of, of systems. This is very positive in the, in the direction that quantum computers uh, will be able to uh, help us uh, calculate in a much faster way uh, the properties of quantum materials. And so this is one of the big promises of quantum computers. Um, this is a Sycamore uh, Google's processor. So this is where this, the whole thing is to calculate this uh, the evolution of of this uh, spin and charge. They also used it before in a previous paper to, to, to prove uh, quantum supremacy. That's what Google said in their paper. Um, so uh, over a year ago, where, where by quantum supremacy, they meant that they could do a calculation in about 200 seconds. Uh, they could create a real, quant uh, sorry, a, a real a random number. Uh, whereas uh, if we used, they claim a classical computer uh, it would take over 10,000 years to, to produce. Uh, so the, um, this is the quantum supremacy paper, and, uh, and this is the quantum circuit uh, to the left, uh, and this is a, pho a photograph of the, of the Sycamore chip, uh, and each one of these dots is a quantum uh, a superconducting resonator. So the, the applications of this quantum computer, they claim is uh, I mean, not only uh, not only Google, IBM, and others are already uh, also have very preliminary uh, quantum computers for drug design, new materials, for climate science, finances, for optimization problems, for crypt cryptography or quantum cryptography, uh, communications, among others. So this is the this is the quantum circuit again uh, the sketch of it uh, I, I must tell you of course I don't understand it in detail but this is just to show you how complex it is the J J is um, the hopping it's the same <laughs> the the same uh, 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 parameter they use uh, people in in the co atoms use instead of T they use J for the hopping they also have the local interactions and then they have swappings and uh, etc. Here they have matrices. Uh, just to show you, I mean, I, I, I can't go into the details because I, I, I don't know the details of all these operations. But it is, this is how they, I mean, what each one of these squares is a quantum resonator, so a qubit. And here we have a qubit for an up spin for a, inside two. The up spins are on top, the down spins are here. And here you have different um, quantum gates performing the spin flip and their local interaction. Um, interaction. Uh, so far for uh, spin and charge separation, uh, another emergent phenomena comes, can clearly be seen in natural cold atomic gases, they're called quantum simulators, as I said, um, a couple of, I mean, some years ago already in the beginning of uh, late 1990s. Um, so two independent groups uh, in uh, uh, Weiman uh, and Cornell and Ketele et al. They got, uh, uh, they were able to produce a quantum, uh, a both condensation uh, in um, in gas in ultra cold atomic gases. In one case with rubidium uh, nuclei and in the other case with sodium atoms uh, at temperatures that are lower than 170 nano kelvin. Uh, and that's why they were awarded the Nobel Prize in, in 2001. Uh, because, I mean, they found this new state of mass up we knew about, the, the both ions and condensation, but they could really reproduce it in a, in a cold atomic gas. 
this is what is called the fifth atomic, the fifth state of, of matter, and it's a, it's a macroscopic um, state in which all the atoms uh, they go, they populate the lowest uh, state in the system. So this is a, a um, well, a colored photograph of what they were looking at, what we look at a photograph. This is a representation of the density of what is called the velocity distribution. Uh, this is the sample. Uh, this is the scale, 0.2, nanomen, uh, 0.2 millimeters, sorry. And, uh, and this is, one can understand it as the um, uh, density distribution in the system. So as we lower the temperature from 400 nanokelvin to 50 nanokelvin, we pass through the both ice and uh, transition temperature and uh, so the great majority of atoms are in the lowest quantum state or in one single quantum state. Uh, it's interesting to see that in June last year uh, the Code Atom Laboratory experiment on board the International Space Station they created uh, both ice and condensation in space so uh, free from uh, gravity. So this is also very, very interesting. And this is, uh, this is an emergent phenomenon. We could not have expected this both answering condensation uh, from knowing the behavior of each one of the particles. We need the interactions and we need the bosonic statistics of, of these atoms. Very closely related to this both answering condensation is high temperature superconductivity or superconductivity in particular. But high TC is interesting because uh, it's still not understood. It was discovered at IBM in Zurich um, several years ago, uh, 1986, um, and uh, by Bernard and Müller, who got the Nobel Prize the year after. <laughs> so it was really very quick. And uh, they, here we see the, um, I mean, the high to see superconductivity. They found that in certain materials. Uh, so let's look here. This is uh, lantern and barium copper oxygen, and and then other materials. They found that uh, they turned superconductors at a fairly high temperature, so over uh, 30 Kelvin, and that was much higher than the previous superconductors discovered in 1911, uh, based on, on lead, uh, mercury, and uh, et cetera, uh, niobium. So then uh, this led to a huge amount of activity in trying to discover new materials with emergent phenomena. They were not looking for superconductivity, they were looking for properties of interacting materials. The materials are, are complex, as you see here, they're all based on rare earths, on, uh, on, on the materials that have a, a, a combination of itinerant and localized electrons. Um, so, so this is one of them, for example, this is yttrium barium copper evacuo, and we have the copper oxygen planes, uh, uh, we have yttrium, etc. So we do not, uh, to date, we do not know what is the microscopic um, mechanism that produces the, the, the high TC superconductivity in these materials. Uh, we don't even understand the normal state properly. There, these are systems are very complex, they have many degrees of freedom, and it's very difficult to, to tackle theoretically. So, uh, well, it, it catalyzed the research in strongly correlated electrons again, and they opened a, a new world, a new important research line uh, of uh, fascinating systems. There are these interacting systems. So, how, why is it so complex? The complexity in these systems, they grow, because it grows exponentially with system size. If we have, um, um, uh, if we, we can study a very small system and we understand it, but if we want to add more electrons or more sites and, and try to get to, to the bulk, to the thermodynamic limit, uh, it, it gets untracked. We need um, numerical methods to, to understand them better. So we must optimize the information. We cannot, uh, we cannot expect to, you to, to use all the, all the sites in the system. It, uh, that, would be, that wouldn't be wise. Uh, as a physicist, we are trained to simplify the systems, to go to the spherical horse <laughs> uh, and, and try to extract the most important information. So we have to optimize and uh, quantum optimization, um, we do it using quantum information, as I will tell you in a system, in, in a second. Uh, let's see, for example, for people who are not in the topic, let's look at the Heisenberg model. The Heisenberg model is a very uh, widely used model uh, to study spin magnetic systems and even also modified versions of this to study neural, neural networks. And one uses machine learning for this. Now it's, uh, there's a whole new movement of using machine learning to solve these systems. 
uh, here we have interacting spins in one dimension. Each one, of, so here we have n sites. Each site has a spin up or down, um, and each uh, spin interacts with its neighbor uh, through an interaction J uh, in this form. So this is a model. Now, just if we only count states, if each site has uh, two degrees of freedom up or down, and if we have n, uh, n sites, we have two to the n states. So as you see, this with n, it grows exponentially, and very rapidly, we uh, run out of computer power to calculate uh, the properties of, of these systems, because we cannot in any way consider all the states of, uh, of these systems. That's why it's exponentially complex, and uh, we cannot expect to solve this in a, in a polynomial, uh, non-exponential time. So these are called uh, non-P problems and in computer science. So this is what uh, John Preskill said uh, 21 years ago, that um, it's very interesting to, so, so 20 years ago there was a new perspective in quantum mechanics, so it's called, I mean, the quantum information perspective of treating problems in quantum, in, in quantum mechanics. John Preskill says that the most challenging and interesting problems in quantum dynamics involve understanding the behavior of strongly coupled many body systems. This, he said these, and I agree with him, are the most challenging problems uh, in quantum dynamics. So uh, better ways of characterizing the features of many particle entanglements may lead to new and more effective methods for understanding the dynamical behavior of complex quantum systems. So we must developed new ways of characterizing the, the features or, to, or new ways of um, filtering information in this system. Very, very rapidly, not to go into details, but this is the system we use. How do we use the quantum information? I won't go into, into the equations, but we use what is called the density matrix romanization group developed by Steve White in 1992. Uh, I rapidly went into this when I was in my postdoc at the Max Planck, and we developed our own uh, our own codes to to treat this. And now uh, there's a whole new area which is huge. Many people working on what is called tensor networks. So this development of Steve White led to the, the development of what is now called tensor networks, matrix product states, etc. So it's a uh, the, the development of how to best use the, the quantum information in quantum systems. So what we do is we start by a, with a very small system, let's say in our in a Heisenberg model with four sites. So we have a two to the four uh, states, which is completely tractable. We 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 diagonalize the Hamiltonian. We get all the states of the system, but then we partition the system in two, and we, we in two halves we call one of this of the half we call it the system in red, and the other one called the, the rest. I mean the the rest of the universe uh, or the bus. We can calculate the density matrix uh, for for the density matrix is uh, it's calculating the projection. Of the of the wave function on on each of these sides uh, on right and left, uh, we form what is called the density matrix. The, the matrix we diagonalize that matrix. When we diagonalize the matrix, we get eigenvalues and eigenvectors. If we keep the eigenvectors with highest eigenvalue, we are uh, choosing the states that have the largest weights in the ground state we're looking at. So very, I mean, I've seen it only in words, but we have a, a mathematical uh, method to choose the states that have uh, largest weights or largest components or the weights that have a la largest information on the state we're looking at in the whole system. So once we choose this, the, the relevant states, we get rid of, we throw away, um, we, we discard the states that do not have a large weight and we can then increase the system size because we are uh, filtering information. We increase the system size, we do this again, uh, we keep the relevant information, the relevant states again, et cetera, et cetera. So we go in increasing the system size by keeping the lowest, uh, the highest weighted states. Um, well, uh, for people who know about DMST, we combine this method with another method called the DMST, which is a dynamical mean field theory. Too many acronyms, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the dynamical mean field theory is one of the um, uh, most reliable methods to uh, grasp the interaction 
in uh, bulk materials. So it's, uh, it's really very good for, for obtaining densities of state and other properties in interacting materials. And at some point, the DMFT, uh, uh, as it is a mean field theory, it, um, it's pinpointing a particular site in the system. And then we have to resolve that, that site also with a many body uh, method, which is, uh, we use a DMRG, which is, turns out to be one of the most um, reliable methods to calculate densities of states in, in the DMFT. Uh, so look, just I mean, uh, I don't want to go into details, but this is we have to solve these systems co as complex as this. For example, the three orbital Kanamori Hubble Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, this is uh, just for you to see the complexity of what we have to of how we model the systems. We have the, the Hamiltonian uh, that is um, characterizing the system has ho has hoppings between uh, the orbitals. Here I have a cartoon, a sketch. So we have three orbitals, the top, middle, and lower. Each one has its own uh, hopping matrix, T1, T2, T3. We also have um, interorbital hopping, T prime. We have a chemical potential. We have uh, on-site interactions U, interorbital interactions, Coulomb interactions U2. We also have interorbital Hund J that, uh, favor, that favors parallel spin. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, um, the, we have to treat complex Hamiltonians like this and how um, how do we deal with this? So this is why when you were using the DMFT plus DMRG. Uh, to make things a little bit simpler, let me show you results for the two orbital Kanamori. So we have only two orbitals instead of three um, with different hoppings. Uh, we're looking at zero temperature. We want to see the, the ground state and some excitations at zero temperature. And we look at the half field and the dog system. So here you have um, uh, the orbital one and orbital two. Um, as I say, they can have different uh, bandwidths. So the top one, orbital one, is wide, and the lower one can be narrow, for example. And we see very interesting physics. Uh, we're, using, we're looking at this in, in a two-dimensional square lattice. Uh, and we see this result, for example. This was very interesting to see uh, two years ago uh, that we we could find a structure in the density of states that hadn't been found before using other more approximate methods like the uh, like the continuous time quantum Monte Carlo or even the numerical organization group um, in other groups. So let me show you. Here we have, for example, uh, for large u, uh, u equal four. Here we have the density of state. So omega equals zero is the Fermi energy. Uh, we have no uh, state at the Fermi energy. So here we have um, a MOT insulator. And uh, we find the lower Hubble band and the upper Hubble band to the left and the right. The black um, curve is the density of states of, um, of, of the orbit of the narrow orbital. And the red one is the density of state in the wide orbital. So this is orbital, uh, the red is orbital one and the black is orbital two. For large U, we have uh, an insulator. If we have um, a low value of U, we, we get a metal. So here we have an insulator to metal transition when we, when we uh, lower the value of the interaction U. And uh, here it gets more complex because here we do have at the Fermi energy a finite density of state. You see the, the black and the red orbitals, both are metallic. In the red orbital, we, ha we have a dip, but this dip is due to finite science effects, but so we, we do have a real, a real metal here. And then we have to the left and to the right, we have the lower and upper Hubble bands. In between, we were surprised to find these peaks here, a tiny red peak and a large black peak, and these are in-gap states we later identified as, uh, as quasi quasi particles and new quasi-particles in the system of the form of Holon and, and Dublin, uh, which I'll explain now in, in a second. Uh, for uh, when we crank up you a little bit from 2.3 to 3, for example, we find that one of the orbitals, the black orbital, um, is it turns a much insulation because we, you see there's no peak at the Fermi energy, while we still have a metal in, in the wide orbital, the red one, orbital number one. However, uh, we also we still find um, a finite these finite peaks uh, in the density of states of orbital two. Uh, and if you see again going back here, if we put a larger u, uh, both when both orbitals are uh, a multi insulator, we do not have these uh, quasi-particle peaks anymore. 
So these quasi-particle peaks exist as long as one of the bands have holes or doublons. And this is very interesting. It was very interesting to see, and we could characterize these excitations as, uh, as uh, drawn here in this cartoon, where we have uh, in orbit, the top one is orbital one and the lower one is orbital two. And the quasi-particles are of this form. So we have a holon and a doublon that move together in a quantum coherent way, uh, giving rise to these excitations. Uh, we were happy to find this because we didn't know these, uh, I mean, these excitations were so prominent and so ubiquitous in these systems. Once we published these papers, then other groups using their old methods, old um, methods to calculate, they found it. I mean, if you know what to find, sometimes, uh, I mean, you can just uh, uh, look more carefully into the parameters and, and they did find it. For example, a later paper by, uh, by, Gabi Kotler von Delft and the group, they using now NRG, they do find for a three orbital uh, Kanamori Hubbard model, they also find uh, these structures that I mean depicted here. Uh, one of the in one of the orbitals, they find these uh, hole and double uh, peaks. They do not see it as a peak because the NRG has logarithmic discretization and it gives you this weird features at zero and at zero at a Fermi energy like the blue curve. So here they have two orbitals, orbitals two and three are metallic and orbital one is insulator and they do find this uh, holon doublon peaks here and to the right they're also, they study the behavior of the holon doublon peaks as a function of the parameters. So this was interesting. Now suddenly we, we do find these excitations in the system. Um, I'm about to, uh, to finish. I just want to show you our very recent results also in a, in a different model, uh, uh, no, sorry, it's the same model, but it's doped. It's not half filled like I was showing you. In, in this doped Kanamori Hubbard model with equal bandwidth, um, we do find uh, new features in, uh, in the middle. What does it mean? If you look, for example, at the lower, uh, the, the density of the curve here, for zero um, interorbital interaction, we have the density of states near the Fermi energy. So here we have a dope system, it's a metal, and we have uh, at between three and four, we have the upper Hubble band, okay? Um, when we crank up now the interorbital uh, Coulomb interaction, uh, this U2, we find that uh, a part, uh, a significant fraction of the density of states of the states in the upper Hubble band are pulled down as shown here in uh, in, in violet, and uh, they pull down even more as uh, long as we crank up the U2, the interorbital interaction U. And we call this the, the Holon Dublin band. Uh, the, the, this, the, the, the arrows are calculations at atomic level. So it's this state here, so it's a very simple calculation with two orbitals only, no bars. Uh, so orbital one has a doublon and orbital uh, two has a holon, and we calculate the energy of this state within the model. So it gives you the atomic energy limit where the arrows are. The, these lighter mauve arrows are these states. So this has three electrons, and then the green states are up, up, and they have different atomic site uh, configurations. The interesting thing is that um, this dotted line it is the density of state of the system uh, projected onto uh, the whole and doublon configuration. So we, we create an electron, but then we destroy it, uh, projecting onto this particular state uh, where we have a whole in band one and a doublon in band two. And, uh, and it gives us a high density of state of whole and doublon in this density of state. Of, uh, that's why we call it the whole and doublon band. Um, uh, this is just to show you the density of state as a function of, uh, of uh, uh, I mean, cranking up uh, the chemical potential, cranking, uh, lowering the chemical potential, so doping with holes. For zero chemical potential, this is a half field band. We have the lower, uh, the lower curve here. The lower and upper Hubble bands, we have no uh, strange, no feature in the density of state because we have, uh, we don't have any disposable holes in the system or doublons. We have a, a mass insulator, so it's quite rigid. When we dope the system with mu equal to minus one, we dope the system with holes. As soon as we put holes into the system, you see here um, we have 
where the violet arrow is, there's a new feature rising, which is a hole on Dublin band, which is separated from the upper Hubbard band. As we dope with more holes, we see that this feature also, also moves. I mean, it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of, of noise. I mean, all this noise is due to finite size effects. So. Um, until for a very, uh, very, very doped system, the feature nearly, nearly disappears. But it's interesting to see how as soon as we dope the system, we are in the presence of this whole and Dublin band. And what happens as a function of the Hund interaction J, uh, also here we, uh, we have a density of state for different J values. And um, if this is the whole and Dublin band where we, where we have this uh, violet triangle, as we crank up J, J mixes different states because uh, if you remember the terms in the Kanamori Hubbard model, it mixed um, uh, Dublin and Holon states across the, the orbitals, and it also mixes, uh, it has a spin flip term, which is the green. So as we crank up J, we have the splitting of the, of the Holon Dublin band due to the mixing of J and a splitting of the uh, magnetic states also by, because of J. Um, Sorry. So this last one, uh, the last result is again the projection of the different excitations in the system. We have a density of state for a particular set of parameters. Uh, here is zero, the Fermi energy. Uh, so again, with, I'm not showing the upper Hubbard band because it's above omega equal four, so for very high energies. What we're seeing here, the black curve is the density of the total density of state, and in different colors, we see the density of states projected onto different excitations of the system. For example, the violet um, curve here is the projection onto the whole and Dublin excitations. You see then that the, the density of states at uh, nearly energy three uh, is mostly uh, composed of um, whole and Dublin excitations. The other, this second uh, hump in the density of state is composed mainly on other, uh, on uh, here you see sigma, sigma prime excitations. So there are excitations that have a singly occupied uh, state in both bands. And this lower uh, negative energy excitation is also formed by uh, sigma zero. So it's a singly occupied spin and a hole on in the other band. Uh, so this is interesting to, um, to see how uh, to see how each excitation is composed. Um, well, uh, so, well, so this is um, yeah, the spectral density as a function of K of these excitations. Again, here in the vertical axis, I mean, I, I, I rotated everything in uh, 90 degrees. The density of states, and here to the right, we see how each of these excitations uh, disperse with the momentum K. We still have to understand this to, to try to get uh, the full momentum distribution of these excitations. Well, so this is uh, this was all about our, our results. Um, so just to finish, I mean, I showed a beautiful view of the of the Fitzroy in uh, in the south of Argentina. Uh, so just to show you that there's a long way ahead. Uh, correlated quantum matter is really one of the most interesting and complex and challenging areas in science, and we're just beginning to invade its mysteries. <laughs> there's a long and fascinating way ahead. Um, so this is uh, what I wanted to tell you about the physics. I just want to finish with some uh, caveat and some thoughts uh, um, uh, on the situation of women in physics, since I think uh, to, to complement or to emphasize uh, what Simone was saying in the beginning. So Carol, shall I, shall I switch and, and briefly talk about that? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Please. Uh, okay. So, well, uh, there are several, uh, several things uh, I'm doing, and, and we're doing from from Argentina and also internationally. Uh, I mean, uh, a lot. Uh, this um, L'Oréal UNESCO is really very active in that. So, I'm uh, after this the prize. Um, the, uh, I have been involved in many activities, uh, mainly. In, and many activities done by L'Oreal and UNESCO, uh, workshops, talks, interviews, uh, networking, also uh, mentoring uh, young women. Um, so it's mainly for women in, in, in physics, in my case, uh, or, or in science. And uh, 
so this is this is really there's a lot going on in that sense. Uh, so I, I forgot I had this because this has to do with the with the women in physics. So uh, just so there's a thanking all my collaborators uh, in during all my years of doing research. But um, so you see from many different uh, different parts in Argentina, Europe, in the U.S., in Tokyo. Uh, but I've singled out my female, my female collaborators, Eliana Rachea, Mario Eugenia Torio, Adriana Moreo, and my current student, Nair. Uh, she has started with me two years ago. Um, I've only collaborated with three or four women among uh, about 30. So it's 10% uh, it's of my collaborators are women. Of course, I didn't choose them. This is the situation. Um, I'm very happy to collaborate with, with all my uh, my male collaborators as well, of course, but uh, but the situation is not good uh, in in physics. Uh, there are very very few women in, in this area of quantum information and uh, and quantum properties of materials. Um, there, are, I mean, uh, Carol knows this <laughs> better than I do. There are, we are very few women. Sometimes uh, I've been to conferences where there are 50 participants and the only one or two women. Uh, and then I ask myself, what is the problem? So in many interviews, uh, I emphasize the fact that we really have, to, we need a, a, an important cultural change. Um, people still think that this is, this is not an area for women. I don't know why, who is told that? Uh, I was wondering why, at, uh, for example, in the 1970s, uh, there were so many, many women, in particular in Argentina, but I think this is quite general, uh, uh, studying uh, computer science, in Argentina, there were many, many more women than men. And then um, that number uh, started to decrease. And now we have a, a very few percentage of even less than in physics of women in computer science. When uh, there's such a lot of work and so many interesting problems to uh, basic and applied problems to work on. Uh, so, so really, this is something that uh, must worry us. Uh, talking about women in science, of course, I already said in the beginning that uh, there's this other problem with other disadvantaged groups that do not have equal access. And when I say women, one has to really think about these groups as well. Uh, now, um, you might know in Brazil, uh, now in July, in June, sorry, there's going to be the Gender Summit uh, organized by the CNPq, the British Council in Brazil, and Portia. Portia is a group uh, um, of uh, women scientists at the Imperial, they, women scientists at the Imperial College in London, they created this group to. Uh, so it is the it's um, the gender summit uh, platform, and they're worried. I mean, they want to address like I wrote here the three critical dimensions of women in in science, which is inspiration. So since the beginning, how we do inspire young girls? The performance. Uh, so. So how they perform during the during their uh, professional work, and then the recognition, because we also have a problem of, of recognizing uh, women scientists. Uh, so the gender summit uh, is going to be virtual, and uh, I am in the steering committee, so I think it's going to be interesting. So why it's going to be virtual? Of course, this is Brazil because it's located uh, at least organized by a Brazilian institution. Then um, the IAEA uh, is very active in promoting women in science, but in particular in, in nuclear activities and in, in nuclear science and technologies. They, uh, yeah, so in particular, uh, the Director General of the IAEA, Rafael Grossi, is very active in this. He is um, uh, really committed in bringing more women into, into these nuclear activities. And they have launched um, a year ago, I was in Vienna and I was invited to talk at the, at the launching of this Marie Skłodowska Curie uh, Fellowship Program for, for young women. So there are uh, scholarships for exchange and for um, and for um, also internships and stays of, of women uh, doing this following this career. I think this is very important. Um, this is very funny because this uh, there's a group of students. I mean, this is a visibility, and many, there's, there's a lot going on, and uh, the change is so, so small, but I think at some point we, we do have to see a cultural change, because you do see young girls doing, this is, these are young girls in the last year of the high school, uh, a group in, in Rosario, in Argentina, and they, uh, 
a, desde la tabla periódica de las elementales and they, they put different names of, of uh, women scientists. Uh, so maybe you can't see, but in astronomy, mathematics, and physics, and uh, and different. So this, and I think it was very nice because they wrote the biography of each one of them and what they were working on mainly. I mean, it's not only to single out women, but to for young girls to realize uh, that there are many interesting topics out there to work on. Um, in Argentina, there was also this. I mean, these are. Yeah, there are many of these activities, but just to show you, Cienti Chicas, so they, uh, they uh, invited me and other uh, 10 scientists in Argentina to, to participate in this. Uh, they invited us to be available to talk to young girls, uh, 10 uh, to 12 year olds, girls that were writing stories about women scientists. And this was very interesting because I interacted with with many young girls that age in different parts of Argentina and uh, by Zoom, we talked to them. They were so enthusiastic. It was so nice to see the shining eyes and, and girls talking to scientists. <laughs> Imagine that 10, 12 year old. And, uh, and this is very motivating also for me. I mean, uh, for them, of course, but it's something that I liked and I enjoyed very much. And I think now they're, they're publishing a book on, on the stories that were written by the girls. Um, so this is uh, where, where I finished, but um, I want to stop sharing. Uh, so, so well, um, then as I said, many other talks at different uh, uh, institutions or locally or internationally. Uh, now I am an international counselor at the, um, at the, on the board of the APS, American Physical Society, and they are very, uh, as um, Simone also showed, um, in, in her presentation, they're very aware of uh, racial, gender, and other types of uh, discriminations. And I hope we can do something from the APS. Any suggestions are welcome. Uh, there's a lot to do out there. There's still a lot to do to change the, the culture, maybe. So thank you so much uh, again. Uh, I'm very happy to answer any question you have. Um, and I'm very, I was very happy to give this talk here, Carol, and. Uh, the physics department, thank you once again. Thanks, Karen. Very interesting. É, a gente pode ligar o microfone, quem quiser ligar o microfone, para a gente agradecer a Karen. <risos> Vamos para perguntas, comentários. É, levantem a mão, por favor, e se, se alguém quiser fazer em português, acho que a Karen entende for o caso. Valber, você está com a câmera ligada, você quer fazer... Ah, o Ricardo levantou a mão. Ricardo, por favor. Um, thanks for the very nice uh, talk. Very interesting. Um, I have a question on... on uh, I think it's the first... Uh, right at the beginning, where you show the charge spin separation study. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, right in the beginning. So the, char the cartoon yeah. or, or this? Yeah, maybe this? Uh, yeah, this one. Yeah. yeah. Do you have, a, do you have a, a, a critical value of view for, for this uh, charge spin separation to take yeah. place? Yeah, this is, um, no, it's continuous. Uh, this is a very interesting question, Ricardo. Thank you. The, um, uh, the complete charge and spin separation is achieved at infinite u. Uh, if you look I at the the, uh, the papers of Heinz uh, Schultz and collaborators of uh, maybe over 20 years ago, uh, they have, um, if you look at this charge and spin density, the complete separation is for infinite u. But if not, if u is finite, there's such a, like an overlap of the excitations. It, it's like a, like a quark. <laughs> I mean, you can... I you have a separation, but it's not complete. As you see here, the, uh, the numerical simulations we did, there is, the charge is moving. There are two components. One is that the broadening of the Gaussian excitation at t equals zero, the broadening is due to the nonlinearity of the dispersion relation. But then there is an interaction here. You see that the, 
they're not completely independent. So one is moving and the other one is a, a sort of, there is some, uh, yeah. it, it looks yeah. like there is something and, and, and it's not, because these excitations, charge and spin are not the pure quasi-particle excitations. So we have to, because here we're looking at the charge and spin densities. So N, N plus, N up plus, N down and N minus. The charge is plus and the spin is minus. If, mm -hmm. if you want to look at independent excitations, you have to look at the better answer um, equations and, and look at the more complex. But in the limits of infinite U, they, they effectively are independent excitations. So, so, so the, 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 the critical U is actually infinite. <laughs> it's, it's not yeah, finite. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah. For, for, for charge and spin densities, the critical U is infinite, but you can find the, the, the excitations are uh, given by the better answer equation. Uh, what I was wondering is whether uh, you would, uh, near the critical U, you could have a dynamic that uh, by, by uh, screening, you could be going da below and above the critical U. So what kind of dynamics you, you would have in a situation like that? You see what I'm saying? Uh, but but yes, this, yes, this is yeah. if U critical were finite, I think. Yeah. You, you could yeah. have a situation like that, yeah. But uh, yeah, and the situation in, in the two dimensions or larger, uh, then for this model, we have tried to look at charge and spin separation and in two dimensions, it's already more marginal. It's not so separated. You do see some, uh, uh, some um, uh, um, uh, different behavior, but, uh, but they are interlinked. So the uh, quasi-particle excitations are not exactly holons hold on and, and um, and spin off. Uh, there are other things, so a little bit more complex. It's, it's, not, it's not so easy as looking at charge and spin. We have to look at other but, individual excitations. But, but uh, um, uh, does, does this, uh, any consideration depends on the number of sites you have in your chain? I mean, like, um, can, you, can, you, can, you, can you say that uh, it, the dogs are barking all over the place. No problem. <laughs> <Sorry>. No problem. <laughs> it's same here. But, um, so, so you can say that for an infinite chain, the U is infinite. The the, the for for charge spin separation. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Of course. Of course. There is a a, um, a scaling behavior, uh, and if if our system were um, too small. We couldn't, we couldn't even see the separation we're looking at here. Now the system is not so big, it's only 16 sites, but we're able to, pr to produce a very localized excitation and then see that they move slightly differently. But a complete charge and spin separation is, uh, is at infinite U and in the infinite system, of course. It's also interesting, I didn't mention, but uh, for these interacting systems, another emerging phenomenon is the existence of, of magnetic monopoles. If you look at spin eyes, uh, or those complex systems where you have spin um, tetrahedra with, uh, with spin interaction, it's very interesting to see how you can separate a, a magnetic monopole. So a, a plus uh, a spin one half excitation and a minus spin one half excitation that move completely independently. And, uh, and this is due to interactions as well. So you can yeah. separate. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, in the, well, uh, uh, the MRG, um, I'm, I'm not. A, I'm not a specialist. So you said that you 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 can you are able to uh, identify the main uh, 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 components of the of the ground state. Is that what you said? In the yeah, DMRG? ground state or yeah or okay. a, any other state you want to target. It's a target state. It can be any uh, state. That's not even. It's not it only the ground state. An, no, it doesn't have to be even a, the eigenstate of any Hamiltonian. Any any pure state. Let's have a, you have a quantum system. Uh, uh -huh. um, if you define one state, whatever state it is, not even, it's called a pure state. It doesn't have to be an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. It can be a combination, but it's only one quantum state, psi. Um, then you can project that psi into the bipartition of the, of the system. You divide the system in two in, in I times J. And if this is uh, algebra, I mean, it's quantum, uh, uh -huh. um, it is a ground, it's a vector you have to project onto I and J. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, I don't have the, the, the equation here to show you, but it's, uh, so the density matrix uh, is this projection of this state. Converges now, to if any, you have, any target yeah, state. Yeah, so any target, that's why it can also be excited states. 
And it can also be a combination of, of states. You can also have um, uh, a statistical ensemble of states in the system. So it's, in that case, it's not pure. You have the, the system yes. can be in states one, two, three, or four with certain weights. It can be a, uh -huh. a Boltzmann distribution of weights. And then, then you have to do the summation of, uh, of the density matrices for each one of these states with uh, appropriate weights. And so that, that's a more thermodynamical uh, treatment of this system. But we are doing it at zero temperature. We're looking at one pure state. And we project, uh, usually it's a ground state, but when we want to look at the dynamics, like we did to, to obtain the density of states, we also project the excitations of the system. It's, um, uh, it's more, more technical, but we use awesome. what is called the, correct, the correction vector technique, and we, and we uh, target the excitations of the systems to, um, to, uh, to get the information of those ex particular excitations with a DMRG. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice talk. <laughs> Thank you. I have been to Bariloche once. And, well, good. <laughs> uh, it's beautiful. <laughs> in the hope summer. Hope to meet you. Man. Hope, hope to meet you. In, in you the can, summer. You can come. In the summer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, Ben. Hello. Thanks for your talk. It was, it was very nice. And I have a question about the two points you showed us in your slides. One is the orbital differentiation, and the other is the superconductivity. Do you know if there is a connection between orbital differentiation and unconventional superconductivity? Because I, I'm, I'm wondering, because in the root and eight, in the iron tides, we have this kind of physics, the huntness, and we also yeah. have a superconducting phase. Can you say some words um, about about this? Well, uh, um, but I didn't understand your first word. So what was it? The superconductivity oh, and what else? I didn't. The, the R pod differentiation and superconductivity. I, I still don't get the first word. Sorry. Orbital, orbital, I guess. orbital differentiation. Ah, orbital, orbital differentiation. Sorry, sorry. I, the, um, uh, no, I, I, let's see. Orbital differentiation. We did it because we wanted to. We wanted to find the orbital selective mode transition. So we wanted to see, like I showed you. Uh, I mean, we, we wanted to study this. Um, this orbital. This is the orbital selective mode transitions because if you look at um, uh, if you look at the middle curve. So U, for U equal to three, we have an orbital selective mode phase. So one. Uh, the narrow band is MOT, and the wide band, the red one, is metallic. So this is, we have a, an orbital di differentiation MOT transition. Now, uh, so then here we, we found it because we were not looking for the, the, the presence of these quasi-particles, and then we finished up trying to look for these quasi-particles in many other models, uh, but we were concentrated in that. Now, with respect to superconductivity, I haven't thought about it, and, and, I, and I don't know uh, an answer to what you say. You say that you do find it. Tell me again the question now, please. Well, it's, it's because in the normal state of rotenate, if you think about strong serotonin oxygen for, for, for instance, yes. we, have, we have this kind of orbital differentiation. Yes, OK. And we have also this phenomena in ionic tides the yeah. normal state but both of mm. them they 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 have the superconducting phase so i, I was just wondering yeah. if there's any connection between these two pieces yeah. of physics i don't think know? okay i don't the think it's an, i don't mm. the hardness uh, and not, the superconductivity yeah i don't think it's a necessary condition in general to have orbital differentiation uh, to to produce uh, superconductivity, uh, but um, the the interesting thing of what you're saying is that these uh, Kanamori and Hubbard models or these systems that are described, they have multi orbitals and they have a combination of localized and itinerant electrons that leads to, in some cases, to orbital different uh, to orbital selective mode transition. Uh, um, they, are, they have many parameters and it's, they're complex enough to be able to produce that. For example, we, um, we, fi we find, uh, let me go back again to our quasi-particles, when, when we have 
we produce holes in one, uh, look here, I mean, we have both, uh, both orbitals in the mod phase. As soon as we dope yeah. the, 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 one of the orbitals, we produce these quasi particles and they're very, very uh, well defined. And suddenly we have these weird ex excitations uh, in, in the system. Now, what would happen is, how, how do these quasi particles behave? Is there an effective attraction between them? Do they lead to superconductivity or not? But they, are, they seem to be in many different systems and people have not uh, taken them into account in the excitations. There, there are recent papers by Ragotto and his group and by, and by Adrian Feyin and others where they do see uh, these quasi particles, whole on Dublin excitation for, uh, for different, uh, different systems, but with, with um, an electromagnetic field excitation. So they're really highly excited states. But we, we see them uh, very, very stable in, in excitations that are not um, out of equilibrium. So these are equilibrium excitations. They are really eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And now my, my student is finishing his master thesis uh, uh, next week. He also did a calculation in, in, um, in, a, la in a, like a ladder system. So it's a one-dimensional system with two orbitals. So it's like a ladder with orbital one, orbital two. We do not resort to the strong local approximation of the DMFT. Uh, Carol knows about that. I mean, this is another approximation the DMFT has. So this is an, in an extended system. We we also find these excitations uh, for certain parameters, the whole double excitation. So I changed your question because I finished up talking about the whole Dublin. But but I think the, the answer is uh, I think there are many interesting excitations we do not know about. I mean the macroscopic realization. We need very precise methods, and, and we are using one of them uh, with, together with the DMFT. And I think that this would give rise now to finding more other, to, to unveil more microscopic uh, uh, details of, of this, and particularly in the densities of states. If you look at densities of states calculated up to now, very few of them really explain the, um, the structure uh, found in experiments. For, for these systems, and it's not easy yeah. to, to explain. So we are aiming at that and try to get more uh, high quality uh, data and numerical results. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Teresa. So thank you for your talk, Karen. It was very nice, very clear. And I have to tell you, I read that paper on spin chart separation when it came out. <laughs> and I, I was starting my PhD and it was the times before Google. So I had to go to the library and I was so happy to find it. And I thought, wow, this is just what I want to do. It was really important to me then because I was just starting to look into strongly correlated systems. And I really, really liked that paper because I, I thought it was very clear to see, you know, how spin and charge were moving separately. And uh, one thing, I, I didn't follow up on, on spin charge separation, but I only see papers regarding this subject in 1D. So how is spin charge separation in 2D? Has it been seen? Is it there at all? Yeah, thank you, Teresa. I'm so glad uh, this was uh, clear enough to to inspire you in this topic. Uh, it, it was really fun for us to do it because it was a very simple time evolution and uh, uh, to calculate. So it's, once you have the the matrix, you can you can time evolve any any state you have. So this was really very simple. And then we were happy to see that uh, now uh, less than a year ago, other groups take it on. Um, but uh, now. In two, in two dimensions, I think there are some uh, numerical calculations and also some attempts with cold atoms to look at charge and spin separation in two dimensions. But mm -hmm. as I said, it's, it's not so clear. You do see some independent uh, uh, evolution of both uh, degrees of freedom, but it's not, it's not so clear. So it's, it's, mar it's still marginal, the two dimensions. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, is still marginal. And three dimensions in principle should be, in general, a Fermi liquid, but uh, you can definitely find models where that is not the case. So some, uh, 
I, I don't, I, I can't recall models now, but in, but maybe in three dimensions with different kinds of interactions, uh, one can reconstruct, um, one can get some special excitations and, and a definitely non, non-Fermi liquid. So this is a non-Fermi liquid also. I mean, these results are, are uh, uh, definitely non-Fermi liquid because they have these weird excitations. Now, so to answer your, your question in two, uh, the, the, it, if you look in the literature, you will find some attempts to, to describe the charge and spin separation in two dimensions. But it's, the result is that it's a marginal separation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good morning. Um, thank you, Karin, for your nice presentation. Uh, I would like to, to comment a comment that you did in your talk. Uh, here in Brazil, in a not so long time, there were many more women in computation than we have now. One point is that the number of the women has decreased with the increase of the money paid in this area. Yes, yes, that's what, that's what I think that happened here too, uh, Simone. Uh, when it gets more professional, more professionalized, uh, mm -hmm. The, the number, but why is it so, the funny thing is that, or oh, interesting, not so funny, I mean, the interesting <laughs> thing is that in, in Argentina and in Brazil and in other parts, uh, it's a similar thing happened, that's why I mentioned it, and that, that shows, I think, that it is uh, a cultural uh, behavior, a cultural mm -hmm. problem we have in our, our societies are very similar, um, so, so we really, um, it's a cultural problem we have to 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 change that uh, impression uh, uh, that uh, the society has on young women. Uh, I just remember how people used to tell me that the career was not for women. What is, what does that mean? I mean that we has that has to stop somehow. And uh, yeah. and the, and also the women themselves that they do not have self confidence. They 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 maybe they did not think they can really they could really afford a. a Computer scientist career uh, with uh, with a more a larger compromise because of the families. So what is it, what can we do with the families? We have to have kindergarten, uh, um, we have to have child care centers, etc. So that that uh, should help. I think it's very important that that we insist that institutions uh, have child care centers. That was important for me when I was doing my PhD. My first son was born in the beginning of my PhD, and my daughter was born when I was finishing my PhD. And in both mm. cases, I, bre I breastfed them until they were eight months or 10 months old. And that was possible because they had a child care center there and because they had a, 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 have a husband that, all, that I mean, we do everything together. But of course, when you're a mother, some things are, yeah. uh, some things are over the mother, but uh, and they get ill and all that. But so, I mean, it's a question of getting organized and, and to, uh, to help young women to be able to afford those problems. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay. So thank you. Questions, comments. So let's thank Karen again. Thanks a lot, Karen. It was very nice. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, so so nice to to see you and to exchange a little bit. Uh, I think uh, it's good to be in contact. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Carol, again, and and all your your colleagues. And uh, let's talk, Carol, at some point. We, yeah, can, sure. we can try to, to talk so, so well. But it was very nice to, to have a little bit of uh, Portuguese and a bit of Brazil here <laughs> after such a long time. <laughs> okay, thank I you so much. I think I can stop recording.